Good evening. I'm Serena Oberstein, Executive Director of Jewish World Watch. Rooted in our own experiences of persecution and Jewish values, we were founded in 2004 when the silence about the genocide in Darfur was deafening. 16 years later, genocide and mass atrocity are still rampant, but we are not helpless in this fight. Jewish World Watch compels and enables people to stand up and take action through advocacy, education, and direct aid to combat mass atrocity worldwide. I wanna welcome and thank you for joining, joining us for the second part of a four-part series on healing and wholeness, all part of Impact in Action, a month of events whereby we are coming together to maximize our collective impact. These coalition conversations are being produced in partnership with UCLA's Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA School of Law, the Center for the Study of Law and Justice at LMU Loyola Law School, and USC Shoah Foundation. Over the next two weeks, we'll discuss legal accountability, the importance of preserving survivor testimony, reparations, and addressing trauma in the aftermath of genocide and mass atrocity. I want to especially thank Kate McIntosh and Catherine Sweetser for all that they've done to make this panel come together tonight. I also want to thank our Global Vision sponsors, Lawrence and Jane Z. Cohen and the Goldrich Foundation. Tonight's panel will explore judicial mechanisms, how they create a historic record, the types of relief they provide, and what role survivors play in the respective processes, with a particular focus on mass atrocities in Asia. UCLA's inaugural executive director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA School of Law, Kate McIntosh, will lead the conversation with experts in the field to tackle this urgent conversation from multiple pers perspectives. Creating a historic record through judicial mechanisms is vital in the fight against impunity and a tangible way to begin the process of healing. We hope you'll join us for the entire series and the month of impact in action, and then we hope that you'll be compelled to take action. Our dynamic moderator, Kate McIntosh, has worked in the fields of human rights, international criminal justice, and the protection of civilians for over two decades. She was involved in the development of international criminal law and contributed to, the, to defining many elements of this new area of law, such as rape as an international crime, the definition of protected persons, and the scope of complicity for international crimes. She has held multiple roles at international cr criminal tribunals, working as a lawyer, prosecution appeals counsel, co-counsel for the defense, and as deputy registrar. For eight years, McIntosh worked in, with Doctors Without Borders, providing legal and policy advice to over 30 countries in support of some of the, most, the world's most vulnerable populations. During this experience, she developed a body of work around the practical application of international human law and its principles. We're truly honored to have her guide us through this conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Serena, for that uh, extensive uh, introduction. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Jewish World Watch, for the invitation. And I'm particularly delighted to have such a prestigious and impressive group of activists, academics, and practitioners with us tonight who are able to take us on a tour of different legal mechanisms which offer or which might offer some form of judicial redress for survivors of mass atrocity. We're going to be looking at criminal prosecution at international and at national levels, at an interstate mechanism, specifically the case against Myanmar under the Genocide Convention at the International Court of Justice, and finally at civil law remedies that are available in the domestic courts here in the US. So we're going to start with the, an example of an international or internationalized criminal tribunal, which unusually did attempt or has attempted to create a role in the proceedings for victims, and that is the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, or the ECCC, also known colloquially as the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. And to speak to really a great honor to have Thierry Seng, who's joining us from Phnom Penh today. Thierry is a US qualified lawyer and a human rights activist who escaped the Khmer Rouge regime as a child, an experience she chronicles in her book, which I highly recommend, Daughter of the Killing Fields. Thierry initially participated as a victim or civil party in the trials at the ECCC, although, as I expect we will hear, she became disillusioned with the court and developed into one of its most vocal critics. You can read Thierry's fuller bio in the chat. 
Uh, Thierry, welcome. It's really very special to have you with us today. Oh, Thierry, I think you're still, I think you're on mute. Still muted. Damn. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry. Hello from Phnom Penh, and thank you so much, Kate, for the introduction. Good to see you again via Zoom. Um, we last saw each other here in Phnom Penh. Uh, hello to everyone on the panel and to all the listeners. Thank you so much for this invitation um, to be with you and to speak about Cambodia, the, um, my, um, my, my country of birth and my, uh, my heart, really. Um, so um, I'll just give you a detour or a contour of the um, Khmer Rouge Tribunal, uh, uh, what we call informally the Khmer Rouge Tribunal or the e, um, Extraordinary Chambers. Um, it, uh, it was established to try crimes committed many years ago when I was a child between 1975 to 1979. So that's the temporal jurisdiction, not crimes before and not mass crimes be, um, um, after. And as you know, there were mass crimes before and there were mass crimes after, but only within those three, almost four years. And um, it took a long time to establish this court, uh, this internationalized court. It's not purely international and it's, um, it's not domestic. Um, it's, it's known as a hybrid court, a mixed court, where it's closer to um, the national court. That's why it's called extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, meaning that um, it's closer to the domestic than uh, to um, to, for example, the International um, Criminal Court of uh, uh, the ICC. Um, it took a long time because, it, um, because of politics, basically, um, and of the, the fact that many of the surviving Khmer Rouge leaders um, were and are currently, as of today, um, are in government. So it was really difficult for the international community to negotiate to establish a tribunal to try crimes that were committed by government officials currently holding office as well. So that was really the major political and obstacle was politics. And then also the regional and global players involved in the atrocity um, or in the politics of that day that led to the atrocities. So but it, came, it came into operation in 2006 and that was when um, around the time that I was heading into civil society and joining civil society from, um, from having been a private lawyer. Um, and uh, it has uh, Cambodian and UN or international lawyers. But as Kate mentioned, the most unique and innovative aspect of this um, internationalized court was the um, introduction of civil party into the proceeding. And to me, as uh, someone who grew up in the common law system and who is a common lawyer, the idea is mind boggling because it's um, from the French civil system. So basically in the common law, as you know, there are only two parties to the proceeding, the prosecutor, the prosecution and the defense. And the prosecution of course represents the victim. But here, um, the novelty is that we have the prosecution, the office of, and the prosecutors who are representing the victims versus the, uh, the defendants. But on the side of the prosecution, we have civil party who are victims who, um, do, and they stand as direct party against the defendant. So it's basically two parties against one on the side of there's the prosecutor and um, the civil party versus um, standing independently from the prosecution and from, from the prosecutor versus the defendant. Um, so it raises the whole issue of equality of arm, um, but that's a different, um, um, and we can talk about that later. Um, so it took a while for me to uh, understand this process um, as I was engaging with victims and, and, and perpetrators across Cambodia to, um, to see how this could work, especially I was coming from the common law background as I was saying, but then as I was engaging on the ground, I realized that the best way to engage them is when they have skin or when they um, um, on um, in the process. 
so they can hear me talk or they can um, listen to, uh, to um, ab about the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. But um, if they themselves could be a direct party rather than representation, then they would be more interested and that was the case. And so it worked in, in, in that regard. So the idea is to enhance um, victims in the, in the legal process uh, with a larger goal of justice and reconciliation, which is mentioned in the preamble of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. And so I got really excited and became the first one to apply and was accepted by the court. And when I applied, um, there was no application form. So I had, uh, I had to write my own form and push um, that act itself pushed or, or triggered the process. Um, the victim's party and, and the victim support section came into being. They had to think about the application form. Um, so the idea is very, very good. It's, um, it's messy. It's very good, and uh, in the Cambodian uh, process, um, there were many, many issues which we can discuss later. Um, but I think I can go. I'm I'm going all over the place, but I think that maybe is um, enough of a uh, um, uh, introduction to what a civil party, especially in the um, Khmer Rouge Tribunal, is all about. It's to enhance. Um, victim's participation as a direct party. And the definition is that you have to be a natural or living person who suffered um, physical, material, or psychological harm. So you can't be, um, you, you have to actually be there um, and have actually suffered. And for me, because I, I applied and was accepted because as a child, I did suffer under the Khmer Rouge um, uh, in particular against the senior Khmer Rouge leaders um, for having killed both my parents, for having imprisoned me. Um, so, um, so basically that's, uh, you have to have um, direct physical harm, um, a psychological or material harm. And um, in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, there's no moral, oh, there's no material or financial reparation, only collective and moral reparation, which is, um, and the downside, and again, we can uh, discuss um, in more details um, in the uh, conversation later. But I think that that's probably in, um, a good summary, Kate, is that okay? That's a fantastic summary, thank you. And I think it's really interesting for especially our US audience to hear, um, to hear that there is such a structure with the independent victims. And we come back to you definitely to hear your views on how effective that is. And also your, the issue you just raised about the kind of reparations which it can actually offer victims. Um, so I'd like to move now to um, a situation of uh, current and ongoing violence. I mean, you referred just in passing to obviously the horrific experience that you had to me you know, as a small child. Um, we're now moving to uh, a situation that's going on as we speak and where no international or hybrid tribunal has been created, at least yet. Um, and in that context, it's my great honour to introduce Tun Kim. Tun was brought up in Arakan State in Burma, but he now resides in London, where he heads the Burmese Rohingya organisation and is, I think we can say, tirelessly active on behalf of his persecuted community. Again, please read um, a fuller bio of Tun in the chat. Um, Tun Kim will speak to us about the situation of Rohingya and in particular his efforts to achieve some kind of justice in the absence of an international tribunal via a universal jurisdiction prosecution in Argentina. Tun, welcome. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to stress many thanks to Jewel Walwash and UCLA's Promise Institute for Human Rights organizing this timely event. Um, I'm Rohingya, I was born and brought up in Arkan State, Western part of Burma. You know, along with 200 plus Rohingya, my parents fled the country on foot to, into the neighboring Bangladesh in the spring of 1978 during Burma's first large scale campaign against Rohingya name, King Dragon Operation. They were repatriated back to Burma in the autumn of the same year, a few years later I was born. You know, my paternal grandfather was a parliamentary secretary during democratic period time, you know, UNU's parliamentary government, British educated, 
Burmese national, a Rohingya man. My grandfather served the newly independent Burma. Two generations on, I as his grandson is now nationality last refugee living in United Kingdom. You know, in spite of our ancestral roots in Western Burma, I have been denied citizenship, nationality in Burma, military government issued me only a temporary registration card, which is known as white card. It indicates neither citizenship status nor foreigner. I had lived in that legal twilight zone all my life in Burma. Younger generation of Rohingya, including me and my peers have been barred from studying at universities and colleges in Burma. In the past, during parliamentary period, Rohingya students formed official Rohingya Student Association and cultural organization in Rangoon. Not anymore today. The Rohingya have been crying out for the international solidarity and support to end our collective nightmare, the nightmare of us being a strip of our nationality status by none other than the Burmese government since 1970s. The nightmare of us being made a stateless, citizenshipless, homeless, all our own ancestral land. You all know that 2017, where thousands of Rohingya have been killed by the Burmese military and thousands of Rohingya women been raped and hundreds of Rohingya children been burned alive and about 790,000 Rohingya fled from Burma to Bangladesh. I visited to the camps on that time. I spent four weeks, I couldn't sleep. And I remember because I left when I was about 17, I know these people, some of them are my friends and some of them are my relatives, you know, as they are from the land of Arkana state. And it's an unbelievable story. You know, I visited to the camp early morning and I back to hotel every, uh, every evening, about four weeks, I couldn't sleep. And the stories are unbelievable. I can't even express, you know. It, one thing that I heard unitedly from them is we want justice. We want justice. We want justice. That is the word I heard from genocide survivors from the camp. You know, justice for the Rohingya means several things. Firstly, it means holding those responsible for the genocide against us to account after independent investigations and before independent civilian court. This is not possible in Myanmar at the moment. The Myanmar government is capable of this. Their investigations are only serving to whitewash military at atrocities will, and will not lead to those most responsible, like uh, my back there, like Senior General Me Online, you know, being held to account. But justice is also about handing the ongoing genocide against us. It means restoring our rights to a nationality, to freedom of movement, to practice our religion freely send out our children to school, access medical care if we need it. You know, it means ensuring that hundreds of thousands of Rohingya genocide survivors can return to their homes. International justice is not an exact science. We need to push several fronts. What is happening at the ICJ and ICC is hugely positive. At Burmese Rohingya Organization UK, which I uh, were I found that with other Rohingyas in 2005, we are advocating for the Rohingya for many years. You know, we have uh, tried a different path, universal jurisdiction. This is based on the idea that some crimes are horrible, that they concern humanity as a whole. You know, it can be tried anywhere, regardless of where they were committed or from where the perpetrator is. The Rohingya genocide it one, such crime. In November last year, we launched universal jurisdiction case in Argentina, where judiciary is where judiciary has a history of trying such cases, including over Francisco Franco, Fesis era in Spain, and our case was supported by Thomas Cantana. He's our lawyer, uh, who is former UN special uh, former a special reporter on human rights in Burma, and also Latin American NGOs that have worked on the same issue. 
our case focuses on the role of Myanmar civilian and the military leadership. In the genocide against Rohingya, important to not just highlight the role of Myanmar online and the general, but also of Aung San Suu Kyi. Civilian government is just a complicit in the genocide. You know, we have seen last few days, the civilian government excluded Rohingya from election, right to vote and right to be member of parliament, which was held last Sunday, you know. For example, my, I mentioned my grandfather was a member of parliament. If I would be in Burma today, I would not be able to vote and I have no right to be member of parliament. That is how they strip up our citizenship. That is how they deny it. You know, this case can send a stronger message to international, a uh, message of international support, global fight against impunity. Argentina showing support in same way as Gambia. The universal jurisdiction case is a pressure tool as much as legal tool keep the pressure on Burma. You know, universal jurisdiction case is one of many tools in toolbox, international justice, important to use all tools available. For the Rohingya, gives hope and recognition that what has happened against, you know, them is the gravest of all crimes. It shows Myanmar that there is nowhere to hide. More and more countries taking action. Argentinian judiciary is currently deciding whether to take up the case or not. You know, we are confident, hopeful of positive ruling soon. You know, in May, we received some good news, you know, when courts in Argentina rule out our case is complementary to the ICC case, not in competition with it. If the court take up the case, this could mean that Aung San Suu Kyi and other officials get called to testify in Argentinian courts over their role in the genocide. This goes to the heart of what so many Rohingya want to see our oppressors stand trial. We need international support to bring justice. We encourage other countries across the world to take up universal jurisdiction cases. Indeed, you know, this was one of the recommendations of the fact finding, UN fact finding mission. Pressure help and the momentum of international justice we see now is hugely encouraging. You know, last two weeks ago, we received um, Argentinian court uh, from ICC, International Criminal Court, sent a letter to Argentinian court, Buenos Aires, that Argent, uh, this universal jurisdiction case is different from ICC, court, ICC case. So we can go ahead. So slowly but surely, the net is closing around Myanmar leaders. This is not less than what Rohingya and Rakhine, Kashin, Shan, Ta'ang, and Karen communities who have suffered from the military for many decades. You know, finally, what I want to highlight is universal jurisdiction case, you know, move one step closer, you know, opening historic investigation in Myanmar military and civilian leadership over genocide against Rohingya people. This, this ruling, the ruling brings us closer to what Big Sin most want to see. The architects of genocide against Rohingya face a court of law we are convinced that universal jurisdiction cases in Argentina will only complement and strengthen other international justice efforts, not undermine them. Thank you very much. I stop here. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you so much, Tunkin. I think you've uh, highlighted there a couple of really core issues for us to discuss, which is what is it that survivors of atrocities want? You know, what is the value of prosecutions? We heard from Thierry talking about the kind of reparations that might be available. You mentioned the right to return, of course, for the Rohingya population. And um, for the audience that's listening who is maybe not familiar with all of the different processes that uh, Tun Kin just referred to, maybe just to say briefly, the universal jurisdiction case he was talking about is a case whereby um, the Argentinian prosecutorial authorities can investigate any un international crime under universal jurisdiction. That's a general legal principle. So they can investigate, in this case, crimes against humanity or genocide. Um, Tunkin also referred to the fact that the International Criminal Court has opened an investigation into the situation in Bangladesh and Myanmar. So I just wanted to fill those two points in. But we're now going to move to another procedure, which is, which is dealing with the situation of the, um, of the Rohingya. Um, 
but not within the criminal framework. Uh, so now it's my great pleasure um, to introduce John Packer, Director of the Human Rights Research and Education Centre and the Newberger Jessin Professor of International Conflict Resolution in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. And the rest of John's illustrious biography again can be found in the chat. Um, John's been closely involved with the action brought by the state of the Gambia against the state of Myanmar at the International Court of Justice, which characterizes Myanmar's treatment of the Rohingya as a violation of the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. John, welcome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kate, uh, for that uh, introduction uh, and also for uh, the invitation. Let me express my appreciation to the Promise Institute uh, and to the Jewish uh, World Watch and commend you for uh, this uh, webinar this evening. Uh, let me also say that um, uh, it, it's a humbling experience to speak after uh, Terry and Tun Kin um, uh, and persons who are expressing uh, in their authentic voice uh, the demands and, and the desires and the needs of victims. Uh, and I have been fortunate in life not to be in their position. Uh, but I, I have been involved in a number of situations, including the Rohingya situation, since 1992 when I was a UN staff member and assisted the very first UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Burma, uh, now called Myanmar, and visited Rakhine in what was uh, the uh, aftermath of the uh, 1992 exodus, about the fourth exodus. Uh, Tun Kin referred to the exodus uh, in which his family was involved in 1978. So just to let you know that the persecution of the Rohingya goes back generations, decades, and that this is not a new situation or, e or even one that's new to the world. There's been 30 years of public reporting on this situation uh, and, uh, and United Nations resolutions year after year. And still the situation evolved into what certainly many years ago, uh, according to many observers, became a genocide. Um, let me just say also in terms of the current situation, it is an ongoing situation. It's not uh, one that's recent, it is present. And that, uh, that uh, situation is actually worsening since the case at the International Court of Justice was brought uh, and since the 2017 mass exodus. Um, there are now uh, in total about 85% of all Rohingya in the world have had to flee their home, uh, have left their homeland. And uh, about half of them live in precarious situations in refugee camps around the world, including the largest refugee camp in the world located near Cox's Bazar in Southern Bangladesh. Uh, the situation is not only not improving, it is worsening. Uh, and, uh, and really we're experiencing now the last stage of genocide, uh, the erasure of the group. Their, their villages, their, the names and places have been uh, removed, taken over by uh, initiatives of the Myanmar authorities. And in the election that you mentioned, Kate, just on 8th, uh, this last Sunday on 8th of November, Rohingya were as a whole and in the region simply not permitted to participate. In fact, the whole region was uh, not per permitted to participate in the election. So that's where things stand. Now in, in 2019, uh, two years after the last mass exodus, uh, the, under the Genocide Convention, which has 153 states parties, uh, a number of states, uh, in particular the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, 57 member states, had taken a resolution that they were going to actually initiate action. In fact, as is pretty much compelling under the Genocide Convention, uh, where it states that states' parties, uh, if they believe that uh, the convention has been breached, they are actually duty bound to initiate a case at the International Court of Justice for, because the matter is of that such seriousness for the international community. But heretofore, only one state has done it, and it's the amongst the smallest and, uh, and smallest in population and, and, uh, and really not powerful state, the Gambia, little Gambia, with absolutely no connection to the situation whatsoever, had the temerity to bring the case in uh, November, on November 11th in 2019, so just, just over a year ago. And they did so uh, on the basis of uh, the principle uh, that uh, genocide is not only, in this case, a breach of the convention, but is a peremptory norm, one that uh, uh, applies at all times and all places, and that there is an actual obligation on any state, and in this case, a, certainly a state party of the convention, to bring uh, a case uh, because it's a matter of general public interest. So Gambia is not asserting that they have a direct injury. There are no Gambians involved. There are no Rohingya refugees in Gambia and so forth. 
they're acting for the international community. So what has happened, I'll just quickly say, and then I'll comment on what this case can mean and cannot mean for the Rohingya. Uh, so the case was initiated in November uh, 2019. It, there was a preliminary hearing in uh, uh, because the Gambia requested provisional measures for the urgent situation that it be halted and, and steps be taken uh, to preserve, uh, not to prejudice the victims. Uh, and uh, that was heard on 10, 11, and 12 December. And quite remarkably, uh, Myanmar, which is a state party and has been for half a century or longer, appeared, including state councillor and foreign minister Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, to defend the position of Myanmar. Uh, a month later, just over a month later, six weeks later, the court issued uh, uh, a decision uh, on the provisional measures, and it included remarkably four orders by unanimous a decision of the members of the court, and that includes ad hoc judges, including the ad hoc judge appointed by Myanmar itself, all agreed that there, the situation was urgent and needed provisional measures. Uh, under uh, that provisional order, Myanmar is uh, uh, extraordinarily to report within four months of that order on what steps is taken, and thereafter until the conclusion of the case every six months. So in May 23rd, 2020, uh, the uh, Myanmar did report uh, and is scheduled to report again uh, in next week, its second report. But I have to underline immediately, those reports are not public information, despite the public uh, interest character of the case. Uh, I, I, it's important to know here that the case and the character of the court has no analog uh, at the domestic level. It's not a civil uh, law action. It's not a common law action. Uh, it's not a criminal action. It's an international legal judicial recourse to settle disputes between states. So the dispute at hand here is between the Gambia and Myanmar. Uh, three other states have expressed an interest and an intention. Maldives has said they would join the case. They announced that their foreign minister in February, I think it was this year, but no further details have come. So we don't know what that really means. Uh, and uh, the Netherlands and Canada, uh, after a long observation and attending the uh, hearings in, in The Hague, announced that they would also uh, uh, not join but would intervene, and that, I'll come back to that in a moment. But what's happened since is uh, just uh, a, a few weeks ago, 23 of uh, October, the uh, Gambia submitted its uh, principal memorial. Uh, so uh, so in, in November last year, it was essentially its allegations and, and seeking uh, provisional measures, and now its principal uh, position, 500 pages and 5,000 uh, uh, attached materials, uh, that's what we've been told through the press. Again, we don't get to see it, and we won't get to see it for a long time, for years. Uh, and uh, in um, July of next year, 2021, uh, Myanmar is to re respond. Uh, so that's a kind of state of affairs. Uh, uh, now, I mentioned these other three states. We will see, because there's 151 states that could join this case one way or another. Um, and uh, let me just say a couple of remarks about this. This case is likely to take many years. Uh, and the proceedings I just mentioned about the memorials and the potential oral uh, arguments, which will be heard publicly some years, uh, sometime after, probably at least a year or two after that, are probably going to be delayed by many intervening uh, uh, actions. And specifically, uh, these, uh, what are sometimes called incidental proceedings, uh, would include uh, the possibility of uh, preliminary objections. Almost certainly, Myanmar is going to object to the jurisdiction. Uh, saying that there isn't an interest on the part of Gambia and so forth. Almost certainly there will be, uh, if there will be interventions, and I won't get into details now, but by the Netherlands and Canada, these will have to be heard. These will take time. Uh, there can be possibilities of discontinuance, uh, uh, and those could be debated uh, uh, or heard again by the court, uh, and there are many other possibilities. So what does this mean, very briefly for me to say? Uh, the court does hold the possibility, and I'll just say a, a little list of things which are potentially extremely important. First of all, it is a judicial instance which will treat the question of whether uh, Myanmar is uh, responsible for violations according to the application of the law. And Myanmar must appear and must make responses and defenses that go to the judicial, uh, to the um, legal character of their obligation. Uh, in the course of that, there's the potential to expose all of this, a kind of truth-telling uh, uh, process, I, I might say, uh, if it was subject to the light of day, as the preliminary um, uh, motion was, uh, and uh, as uh, should and could be if other states were to ask that the current pleadings would become public. 
It's possible also that there could be mobilized substantial political pressure. Already some states, Germany, for example, has suspended its uh, uh, aid and assistance pending the resolution of this case. Uh, much else could follow in that domain. There could be uh, possible orders from the court. There could be potential uh, uh, re uh, reparations that could be very, very substantial. And, and, and not just orders of return, but reparations of return of property and housing and so forth. Uh, the consequences could be enormous. Um, that raises doubts about the uh, about investments, about development, about transference of property, uh, uh, titles, and so forth. Uh, uh, it could have implications for individuals because, in the course of this, it may come to light that certain individuals, in fact, breached international criminal law. Uh, uh, it could have all sorts of uh, similar uh, effects. Then there is an interplay in this with the International Criminal Court. We haven't talked about it, but just to say, or the or the Universal Dec uh, Jurisdiction case, in Argentina. Um, now, what it's not, and this is the key point I just want to uh, draw your attention to from the, our perspective, this is not a process, uh, unlike uh, Terry remarked upon in, in Cambodia, where the victims are the center of the matter. In fact, the victims are excluded from the process. They are literally not parties. They have no standing. They have no rights of attendance or appearance, or uh, they actually have no right of even uh, visual right. They can't even see what's being pled or, or defended. And so this is quite remarkable where the subjects of the actual case, the, the, the Rohingya as the protected group under the Genocide Convention have no place in the procedure. Uh, and, and this I think is something that uh, in terms of voice needs to seriously be reconsidered and also in terms of the effectiveness of, of the, of the uh, judicial process because this is supposed to be a court of justice. And uh, justice not only should be seen to be done, but at a very minimum, those who are subject to it, those who are in fact to, to be protected by it, should uh, have the possibility of seeing that justice be done. Uh, so at the moment, uh, that is a tremendous shortcoming. Uh, there is also uh, no possibility here uh, for intermediary relief for the victims themselves. So while this case is going on, I've mentioned you know, the millions of Rohingya, about two and a half million, uh, who are out of the country, a million in a refugee camp in southern Bangladesh. Uh, even those in Myanmar, uh, about 120,000 of them are still in an internment camp. There is no possibility of interim relief, essentially, for them, not at least in their own right uh, of, uh, uh, of initiative. So there's obviously shortcomings. Nonetheless, I would say on balance, this is a good thing. And we would certainly hope that other states, including the United States of America, potentially now with the new incoming uh, administration, might actually engage and at least ask that the proceeding become public. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. John, thank you so much for that um, wonderfully clear explanation of such a complex process and uh, bringing to light issues like the fact that the International Court of Justice has all of these powers at its disposal, and yet the voices who should be determining how that compensation is awarded or how those powers should be used are currently excluded. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, in the audience that you can put questions in the chat, which we'll come to um, at the end of the presentations. And I'd like to thank John for raising the issue of the United States. Uh, as that is an excellent segue to our final speaker. Um, we're going to complete the picture. Um, so we've looked at, just to remind you, we had Thierry start with the hybrid international court in Cambodia. We had Tunkin talk primarily about this criminal process which is being initiated in Argentina about actions in Myanmar. John just took us you know, magisterially through this interstate uh, litigation that's going on at the International Court of Justice. And our last speaker today is um, Kathy Sweetser, who's going to take a look at how US courts, US domestic courts can offer a path to redress for victims of atrocity crimes. Kathy is the deputy director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights and her work focuses on human rights litigation in the United States. Uh, her full bio is in the chat. Kathy also teaches the Human Rights Litigation Clinic at UCLA Law. Kathy, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, I agree with you, it's great to go after John because you touched on a lot of themes that I wanted to bring out as well when we're talking about domestic court litigation. I'll only be talking about US litigation because I'm a US lawyer and that's what I know about, but these same types of cases have been brought in other countries, including the Netherlands and England, um, the same types of national court litigation to vindicate victims' rights. So um, 
basically, I just wanted to start off by talking about something that we were talking about on Tuesday, if you joined us for the panel on Tuesday, which is the power of bringing, being able to bring your narrative to a national space and to an official government space. So the crimes that we're talking about here, such as torture and genocide, are crimes that are really designed to control narratives, to break down peoples, to ensure that only a certain type of story and history becomes told. And if you have any familiarity with Elaine Scarry's The Body in Pain, she has a very interesting analysis of torture that these types of crimes are really designed to use pain, to use force, to, to reshape how people are allowed to think about the world. And I think that type of framework is really important when you're thinking about why are these cases necessary? The cases are necessary in order to allow oppressed peoples and to allow victims of these types of crimes to really present their own story and not be silenced by what they've been through. And so I think in the US, there's been a lot of contestation right now about whether this type of litigation is valuable at all, right? And there's been a lot of judges saying or ruling in ways that would imply that, you know, these aren't really the types of cases that we should be hearing that these cases, they're not sure why cases that take place abroad should come to our courts. They're not sure why um, victims need civil remedies if they can have criminal remedies. But these types of remedies are so important for the same reason that the panelists were saying before, because they allow the victims to take charge of their own narrative and to be the players in their own story. And as lawyers, we really emphasize that the client is in control of this litigation, that the client is telling their story, and that this is their time to litigate their case the way they want to. Of course, you know, the lawyers are there to provide strategy and to provide insight. But the idea in the US has generally been to do client-centered lawyering, where the client is the focus of the effort. And what you do is for the client's benefit, and also not just for their benefit, but also really within their control. And that's a way to overcome the past trauma that has really removed the control from the client. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about three types of cases that we see in the US. Um, the first one is the alien tort statute. So I wanted to use an example case that's not pending right now. Um, it's a case called Mujica versus Occidental Petroleum. And in that case, the case concerned uh, the bombing of a civilian village by, air, by the Colombian Air Force. And involved in this bombing was the company Occidental Petroleum and its security contractor, Airscan. And their involvement was very, very integral to the bombing. So they allowed the raid to be planned from their offices, according to the complaint. The complaint also alleged that they flew with the government on the raid. So Airscan was a company that had aircraft and they flew with the government on the raid that bombed the village and pointed out to the government where to bomb. And so the, there were civilian personnel with the government at this time. Now this case was, this is a 2014 case and it was thrown out of court eventually in the Ninth Circuit on the basis of comedy, which is a doctrine that says we should respect other countries and we should let them decide their own processes. So even though Occidental and Airscan were both US companies and the plaintiffs were suing in the US against these US companies, the, the court found that, you know, Colombia was the appropriate forum and these should go to Colombia. And in fact, there had been a proceeding against the Colombian government in Colombia that had resulted in compensation. And the court basically found, well, since there already was a proceeding, we don't need to hear it here. Um, and the, what's lost when you don't have these types of civil remedies against individual perpetrators is that you don't have compensation and accountability flowing from the people who are involved in the crimes to the victims. You might have an acknowledgement by one party, but if you don't have an acknowledgement by all parties that something wrong has been done, you, the victims may not feel completely satisfied. And that's why the civil remedy can be really important, even if there's some sort of administrative proceeding or there's a criminal proceeding also um, proceeding. Um, the next type of case I wanted to mention was the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. And that's another type of case that's explicitly extraterritorial. So if you're, um, hurt abroad, but someone is knowingly benefiting in the US from your trafficking and your forced labor, you could bring a lawsuit here. You wouldn't have to bring it in the country where you were trafficked. So I represent seven Cambodian plaintiffs who were trafficked into Thailand and they were um, held there in a seafood factory. And then they have now managed to return to Cambodia. 
And so that's the type of case, in that case, the factory was vertically integrated with a factory with business in the US. That's the type of case that you could bring in the US because trafficking was occurring when a US company was a participant in a venture that was engaging in trafficking. And then the last case I wanted to mention was the, the, a case related to the case brought by the Gambia and the ICJ. So there is a case under 28 USC 1782, which is a statute allowing you to bring discovery subpoenas in the US. So this isn't the type of case for compensation like the other two types of cases I was mentioning, but I think it's relevant to what everyone else was talking about because it's a way that you can get truth, um, the discovery of truth, right? Because you're asking in the US for documents and discovery related to what's going on. So in that case, the case is against Facebook and they're subpoenaing Facebook to get information and documents because Facebook was used widely to perpetrate the ethnic cleansing genocide in Myanmar. So that's why that's why the Gambia is bringing that lawsuit. And it, that's still pending. As far as I know, the judge hasn't made any ruling in that case as yet, um, but it's an interesting case to follow. And it's another way that US lawyers can help enforce these norms in the US. So that's, that's all I want to review. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> before we open up to the audience, I'd love to come back. So I think that um, as well as exposing the very complex legal architecture that is available actually um, for survivors of atrocity crimes, I think each of our speakers have highlighted different um, different remedies or the different value that some kind of legal redress can have for the speakers. And I'd like to go back to Thierry um, and ask her, Thierry, you flagged that um, the idea of the civil party structure at the ECCC was important because it would encourage victims to actually get involved in these trials, which after all were happening, you know, several decades after the crimes had occurred in Cambodia. And I wonder if you could just share with us your reflections on how effective that was at the court and whether you feel that, you know, victims, I mean, yourself included, but other survivors of the atrocities, whether they were able to get some kind of satisfaction from those trials, and if so, what was that? And, and in what ways did it fall short? In the Cambodia context, the civil party, um, idea worked really well in the beginning because it, it triggered conversations in the public forum. So we have the legal mechanism, which was necessary, but um, it was very deficient. Um, generally, any legal, def and legal mechanism, any court will be insufficient to address justice because there are so many elements of justice. And in the Cambodia context, it was, I mean, it's definitely, we need the legal mechanism. It's, it's necessary and generally it's not sufficient um, to address uh, and we need a truth uh, 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 commissions, formal, informal um, in the Cambodia context, we don't have a formal one, but we did try to create an informal uh, formal one through our public forum conversations, engaging directly civil society, going out to the provinces, meeting with victim survivors and engaging them, bringing court officials along, bringing other experts um, along and then giving them the forums to engage with these experts, the victims and the perpetrators. So the, the civil party um, concept is a very powerful one. I would retain it for sure. It was very, it was not as effective um, in the long run in the Cambodian context, even though it started well because of politics and um, the larger um, political um, obstruction just overwhelmed the whole thing. Um, uh, the way that democracy has been overwhelmed by China, who is back in, in Cambodia again, and all the other various global actors. Um, but if we're, if we're looking at just the concept of civil party and civil party engagement in Cambodia, it was effective because it had other support, it had the infrastructure to support it. We, there was a vibrant, a vibrant civil society. We had the informal public forums, which um, worked along the judicial, the legal uh, mechanism. And we tried to create um, a space to enlarge that space and to um, create further space for, uh, for participation. So um, I saw the excitement 
in the population when I, I, I engaged them prior to the, the civil party um, um, process and I engaged them after and I saw the excitement. There was just a different level of interest of engagement. It was whether I was just listening to learn or listening to learn in a, in a different and a level because now their interest is personally involved. Will they get compensation? What will be the reparations? Will um, and then they turn out. Um, then they found out that it's only collective and moral. Which in for mass crimes, I think it's really the symbolic value needs to have additional um, material um, uh, benefits in terms of, uh, for example, schools. The bill. Um, there has to be, even if it's minor, um, uh, minor to us, but uh, it means a lot. To them, and one of the uh, compensation that I really demanded for was learning centers using the equipment from the court for the learning centers, and as a, 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 um, a request as simple as that was turned down by the court. And the other, um, um, I'm all over the board now as my as I'm, as I'm, think, I'm thinking of the effectiveness. Um, Gen the again to just to capture the uh, the larger idea it's it's a very powerful idea that needs to be retained but the challenges posed along the way are real one one of the um challenges to the civil idea um participation in cambodia were, were the judges um they did not want a chaotic courtroom understandably i mean the idea the concept were written and were established by judicial philosophers by um, activists um, who were not going to be in court, but the practitioners on the ground, they did not want to see me in their courtroom ringing. Um, they want decorum. They want um, the familiarity of the courtroom that they had um, uh, and that they, they've known. And uh, so um, it was understandable that they and should fear the, the chaos of it all. But in the Cambodia context, it, it, it was um, the problem were not with the victims and the, with the, um, the civil parties themselves. They were with the administrators. They were with the lawyers obtained to represent the civil party. So then the, the, uh, the process became really administrative, really um, bureaucratic. And all of a sudden, the direct voice of the, um, um, of the victim now are layered and pushed back by the co-civil party leaders um, and lawyers, and then the other civil party lawyers, and then the civil party. So it, it's um, it needs reforms, and I think we we can draw many lessons and we can um, um, elicit many lessons from the process. But the idea is a very powerful one that needs to be retained, and the concept of only moral and collective moral being symbolic, collective being society level and not at an individual level for mass crimes without the material, even if it's minor, even using equipments of the court for learning centers, for example, um, it's not a possibility. If it's only moral and um, collective reparation, it's not enough. Thank you, Tiri. That's a, yeah, that's really clear. And I mean, I think that we can, th your comments about how um, all the problems and the layers of bureaucracy and the distancing of the voice from the victims from the courtroom and how the court would manage it, we're seeing playing out, of course, at the International Criminal Court, which is trying to craft some effective victim representation and having, having difficulty there. Um, I'd like to turn to one of the questions from Brady Mabe. I think you've answered a uh, Brady's initial question to a certain degree. His second question is to Tun Kin. He says, you've mentioned the importance of justice to the Rohingya. What does that look like? You discussed criminal accountability for Aung San Suu Kyi, Min Aung and others. And I imagine it would also require amendment to the citizenship law at a bare minimum. What other substantive measures are necessary for justice to be served? Sure. <clears throat> Justice means uh, for the Rohingya is many things. Firstly, they want to bring, we want to bring those responsible to justice, particularly criminal, me online and others who are responsible. And also we want to return our homeland with our rights and also compensation to our original villages. Our house has been burned down. We want to get back our houses and 
our lands been confiscated that need to get give back you know our schools been burned down that need to be built up and so for the citizenship issue of course uh, we want to we are not grant asking burmese government new citizenship or anything we want to asking them demanding to give back our rights so of course um, those all are when you ask just that is what rohingya wants justice first uh, bring justice bring them to responsible and then secondly get back rights and others and of course here 1982 citizenship law is the root cause of the problem that law deprived basic basic fundamental rights of the rohingya because of that law i am not a citizen of burma even though my grandfather was a member of parliament during the democratic period time so it is important that law amendment we have to in burma not only rohingya some other minorities been facing that that law targeting particularly Rohingyas and some minorities, particularly for the Rohingyas, I should say. Uh, so um, the question is about, uh, he was asking. What measures are necessary? So I think you, the talking about the right to return is really important because that's something that many of these yeah. digital mechanisms are not able to order. You know, like uh, when we talk about here, right to return, for example, my argument, I, I will bring up this point. I talked with some Rohingyas last three days ago. When I asked the situation, they are telling me they cannot go to school. They cannot move from one village to another, from Philadelphia to I mean, to Washington DC, they cannot visit even, they cannot travel, you know. Uh, for example, from Ottawa to Toronto, they cannot travel. That is what their problem they're facing, you know. So they cannot go get medical aid. They cannot get admission to government hospital. They cannot get medical aid. And on top of that, if they want, uh, on top of that, government is pushing them to take NVC card, which is nation and NLD government is doing that. NVC card, national verification card. That NVC card is a kind of you become, you are a foreigner in Burma, they will verify, you know? So that we, we already citizen of Burma, we are. So what we need to fill up that form, you know? As I mentioned, like my grandfather's father has been there. So, if they ask me to fill up this form, I'm not filling up. Why I need to do that? That NVC card is, if you take that card, you become permanently foreigners, illegal, you become illegal immigrant officially. But for now, if I would be in Burma today, they will say I'm illegal immigrant. I will ask them, what is the proof? I have evidence that I'm a citizen of this country. What is the proof you telling me I'm illegal immigrant? But when I take this card, NVC, they will, they will be, they will get an evidence that they are making me, by law, I'm an illegal immigrant. That is how the government is playing very tricky way. They are using the laws. It's been proper institutionalized, destroying our community with intention you know, by restricting those measures, what I mentioned earlier a few times. So this is how the government is doing. So when right to return with the right safety with protection is the most important thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we're getting to the end of the time, but I do want to take just a couple more minutes and also let John and Kathy have a last word. John, I wonder if, as well as any other reflections you'd like to share, I wonder if you could just talk to us about the extent to which the International Court of Justice might be able to address the issues that Tun King has just highlighted. No, thanks, Kate. You know, I, I listening to that and, and in the kind of almost 30 years I've been involved in this uh, meeting with Rohingya uh, all over the world, uh, outside the country, but also inside the country, the demand for justice is, is ever present. But what they almost immediately voice with that, and, and Tun Kim just did it now, is, is those outside the country, they say, we want to go home. And what they mean by home is not just a physical location of their place of origin, the environment of home. They, they mean they want to live in peace. They want to be able to 
you know, regain their dignity and to live a full life as they did before. And the notion of justice here that's crucial that the International Court of Justice itself can help with is the very first element of justice here is recognition. I mean, even under the Genocide Convention, uh, you must be a protected group. And in a certain sense, the court has already granted that to the Rohingya. They have said at least prima facie that uh, the Rohingya exist. And it's notable that at the International Court of Justice, you know, the, the, the Myanmar defense, uh, they're, they're not a defense, the respondents bent over backwards to avoid at almost all costs using the word Rohingya because the thrust of their position is that they do not exist and we will not recognize them. And so this point of recognition, uh, 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 you know, which also goes to the idea of the existence of a group, the essence of not only genocide is the, uh, the, is the destruction of the group, but in human rights law, first of all, a group has a right to exist. And that existence is not just in a physical biological sense, it is as a social, cultural, you know, dynamic community. And to be seen as a, the essence of justice is also that justice has the light of day that it is, it is seen. So here I think, I think we really need to um, think a bit more broadly. Uh, there is a preoccupation of some people that you know, we wanna see the bad guys arrested. You know, the, the bad guys arrested, if that is ever done, and, and God knows whether it will be, will not actually return the Rohingya to their homes, will not actually create the conditions of living in peace. Uh, it, it's, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but I'm just saying we need to keep our, our eyes on the, the big picture here. And, and the big picture is not only for the Rohingya, their existence, it is existential in the, in the literal and broadest senses, but also for regional peace and security, for the kind of our sense in the world of what justice broadly means. And the court has the potential here in this case to say something meaningful to the world and to the Rohingya about this. Thank you, John, so much. I want to just, I think you also referred, you know, beautifully to the point that Kathy had made about telling the story, the right to exist in a narrative as well as, as a social group and as, as living human beings. I just want to draw attention to one question which I don't think I have time to answer, but I've put in the chat is from one of our participants who would like to draw everyone's attention to um, over 150 with their family members. Um, I think family members of um, the participant were murdered by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in 1975, which is not written in the history of the Cambodia genocide. So I put the link to that article in the chat. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time to go into that in more detail, but um, please have a look in the chat for that information. Cathy, I'd like to give you the opportunity just to reflect on what you've heard and, and close this out. Sure, well, I think just briefly, I think going back to the theme of these panels, you know, when we hear about these types of egregious atrocities that are being perpetrated today, we have to remember that these crimes and these international law violations aren't just something we hear about from the Nuremberg trials, and it's not just something we think about when we're saying, oh, we'll never forget these types of atrocities. We really have to be attuned to what's happening in our world today. And I think, you know, the types of violations that you guys are talking about are the types of things that we can all say, you know, no matter where we are, if we're in Argentina, if we're in the Gambia, if we're in the US, we know that these are violations of international law and we can tell that there's a universal standard that's being violated. Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, I'd just like to thank our panelists so much for joining us. Tunkin is in London, it's five past two in the morning. Thierry is joining us from Phnom Penh. Uh, John from Ottawa, Kathy from LA. Uh, it's been wonderful. And I would just hand over then to Serena from Jewish World Watch to finish up for today. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, I actually can't turn my video back on, but I'll, I'll just say um, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to you, Kate, Kathy. Um, this was incredibly informative, and I think we we see in so many ways why uh, judicial judicial mechanisms for recognition, accountability and especially healing for the victims of, of genocide and mass atrocity is so necessary. Um, as, as I said at the beginning of this, um, this is part of a four-part series and uh, we have two more panels next week. 
Um, we hope that you will um, continue to stay with us. Um, and and um, if you wanna go and support the Rohingya people in the Cox Bazaar camps, we'll put a link in the chat box and you can um, address some of their urgent needs if you feel compelled to act. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We look forward to continuing this conversation and talking about how to create healing and wholeness in the aftermath of genocide. Have a great evening.